have your attention, please. That was a good social crowd. Really yeah, good. yeah. Oh, it actually doesn't work. It's just for the recording in the back. Yeah. Thank you, though. <laughs> Alrighty, good evening, everyone. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, the mic actually doesn't work. It's just for the recording there in the back. Um, so if you're confused about that, yeah, I am too. Um, well, okay, thank you all for coming. My name is Maddie. I'm a winter naturalist here at Aspen Center for Environmental Studies. And yeah, we're just really excited uh, that all of you chose to uh, indulge in continuing your education tonight. Um, so each winter, ACES partners with Wilderness Workshops and the Roaring Fork Audubon uh, to co-host these Naturalist Nights. Um, and it's a free winter series uh, featuring experts <laughs> from across the country um, uh, to explore different topics uh, of the natural world and bring it back to our community here. Uh, these events are hosted every other week, Wednesdays at the Third Street Center in Carbondale, Thursdays here at Hallam Lake. Uh, and yeah, we'd like to thank our generous sponsors. Uh, they help make these naturalized, naturalist nights possible. Um, especially thank you tonight to Reese Henry and our other gold level sponsors, Clark's Market and Ken Ransfer, uh, as well as our silver, silver level sponsors, uh, bear with me, Aspen Square, Ute Mountaineering Blazing Adventures, Cripple Creek Backcountry, Two Leaves in a Bud, Aspen Ski Company, Bonfire Coffee, The Village Smithy, and Bristle Cone Mountain Sports. Sincerely, thank you. Uh, these businesses provide financial aid and in-kind donations that make naturalist nice possible, like the cookies and tea that we get to enjoy. Um, Grassroots TV in the back there is live streaming tonight's presentation. Uh, as well as on the websites for Wilderness Workshop and ACES Facebook page. Um, so a little bit of a cleaned up version will be available in a couple of days uh, from today. So uh, we hope you'll join us again for uh, Wilderness Perspectives and Pop uh, or excuse me, uh, Wilderness Nights and Pop Belly Perspectives uh, in the next couple of weeks. And our last Naturalist Night is uh, two weeks from now, and it's entitled Ancient Wetlands and Their Essential Value and Threats in Our Warming World. So that'll be the last Naturalist Night again two weeks from now. So now I'm excited to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Jason LaBelle. Um, wow, such a privilege to have you here. Jason is a professor of anthropology within the Department of Anthropology and Geography at Colorado State University. Go Rams. Um, director, he's also the director. Yeah. <laughs> uh, he's the director of the Center for Mountain and Plains Archaeology, as well as the cur curator for CSU's archaeological repository. Uh, his research speciali specializes in the subsistence, mobility, seasonal aggregation, and camp layout of Native American hunter-gatherers inhabiting the West uh, over the past 13,000 years. So cool. Uh, <laughs> and he has a primary emphasis in Colorado. Uh, and he has active research projects underway in Rocky Mountain National Park and within several wilderness study areas in the deep canyons of the Northwest. Um, I will ask any questions that you may have, if we could reserve them for the end. The presentation will be about 45 minutes or so, and then we'll have a 10 to 15 minute Q&A. Um, we'll try to get to everyone. Um, and with that, Jason, I'll leave it up to you. Great, thank you. Um, I think I have... I'm not sure I can use that. I think I get this mic, is this one to use? Yeah. Okay. Don't worry, I can boom it out. I have to do it for... Uh, teaching all the time. You know how to get the, uh, it's got a password on here. Okay. Is it water? Oh, that's weird. <laughs> now you all know. <laughs> it's not one, two, three, four, it's something else. Okay. <laughs> Oops. Yeah, is a Is that on? It looks like it's not even on. I can do an interpret dance for you. I can do shadow puppets. I'm used to multifaceted entertainer here. 
I could do that. I could demonstrate in that level. Yes. Set some snares outside. There's some lights on. Okay, let there be light. Great. Whoa, all right. Well, I'm very happy to be here. Um, really excited to come up to the mountains. A uh, beautiful setting, a nice festive crowd. So happy to share with you uh, some of the research I've been doing over the years. Um, and I'll be talking about a topic that most people don't know much about. Oops, let me just, I'm gonna get a timer going here. So I have a couple things I want to cover tonight with you. Um, I'm going to talk first, kind of about a third of the talk, about Native American use of Colorado's mountains. And it's actually more intensive than you might realize. And it goes from about 13,000 years ago until obviously to the present day or within the last uh, century and a half, uh, when unfortunately we had forced removal to reservations throughout the West here. And then I'll spend the, the majority of the talk talking about a specific kind of mountain archaeology that we call alpine hunting traps, which are amazing. I'm going to give you an example from Rollins Pass, which has the densest concentration of these types of features in all of North America, um, and that's not hyperbole. Um, and what I want you to really reflect on is the ingenuity, the kind of mapping onto place in terms of just understanding of ecology um, and location that these ancient indigenous hunters happen to possess, and I hope that gives you a new appreciation for their understanding of these places through deep time. And again, that's something that a lot of folks don't spend much time thinking about. This work is part of uh, my research lab, which is the Center for Mountain and Plains Archaeology, where we do work throughout uh, Colorado from, from the Nebraska-Kansas line all the way to Utah in all the different kinds of ecosystems, although my, the Alpines is my favorite. Uh, and we do this from a variety of different kinds of ways, field schools, grants, uh, my Rocky Mountain National Park work. I'll show you in just a, se a second some grant work, a lot of thesis projects with graduate students. Here's some fine folks you can see there. And so this is just us this last summer uh, at the headwaters of the St. Vrain River, which is a major river on the Front Range in the Wild Basin, uh, doing survey above, right at and above tree line. This is a map showing you uh, the traditional territories or the lo locations of different specific subgroups within the Ute uh, Nation and where they happen to be within Colorado, again, at the time of, of Spanish contact uh, in the late 1700s um, or the, the 18th century. What I like to look at, though, is to try to figure out, well, what happened uh, to the Utes that we know here and their ancestors within the last thousand years and then marching that back farther and farther and farther back in time. We know confidently that people have occupied Colorado for at least 13,000 years. If kids have, or if adults have children every 20 years or so, you're looking at 600, 700 generations of, of people here. That's a long amount of time. So when we talk about the Utes, and here we have Chipita and Ure, uh, they, they are mountain dwellers. Uh, this was the first uh, agency called Old Agency just south of Cochitoba Dome, in the back way that you get into the San Luis Valley. Uh, kind of a bad place to put their, their first agency. This is where they're getting trade annuities uh, from the federal government. Eventually, they'll, they'll establish a new agency outside of Montrose and Delta uh, because this is a little too high uh, in, in altitude. So there's a couple questions, one and two, that kind of direct some of this work that we'll be walking through. And this is a non-technical talk. This is meant to be something that kind of just gives you the highlights of some of this research. But I want to explore to what degree do people live in the high mountains, the subalpine and the alpine, above tree limit, right, up in the sky, as compared to the valleys and parks below, which makes sense. I mean, that's where most people of us live today is down low. And in the high mountains, how did they use passes are they just pass-throughs, or are they used for more specific purposes? Are they going there as destinations? The short story is all these things are variable, and they change across time, and they change across different mountain ranges. As you should know, every mountain range in Colorado is different. It has different kinds of features and resources in it. And obviously, it's people, because they live so intimately with the land, they've mapped onto these things early on. So there are lots of things that draw people to the mountains. Uh, for example, the, the folks that I'm going to be talking about they need to find rocks uh, to make stone tools. They can't give them Amazon Prime. They have to go get them themselves or trade. 
And the mountain ranges as compared to the flats east of Denver, the Great Plains, there's no rocks out there whatsoever. So they need to come into the mountains, but six months out of the year, some of these places are inaccessible in terms of getting those stone from those, those places. Some ranges where I work, the Rocky Mountain National Park, has no tool stone. You have to bring it into those places. So we know those rocks were brought in through trade or direct, directly moved there. Obviously, big game. The people that I study are hunter-gatherers or foragers. They are not growing corn. They're not growing any kind of cultigens. They're living off the wads of the land. And so big game is a big part of their diet. Obviously, the big four of elk and deer and bighorn sheep and bison, but not moose and mountain goats, which are recent reintroductions in Colorado uh, in the 1970s. Native fish are important in lower streams and rivers, but when we get to the Alpine lakes, there's no fish in those lakes whatsoever. They fall from the sky these days, right, from helicopter drops. <laughs> um, but they, they are not swimming up into most of those lakes. They were inaccessible uh, in ancient times. And then obviously, lots of plant resources. So we are what we eat, but we're so much more than that. There's other reasons that people do things, like go up in the mountains. And so there's obviously spiritual and cultural reasons that I'll talk about. Abundant evidence of going up there for prayer and for vision quests, for, for, for divinity type purposes. And I think a lot of us understand the power of these places, the aesthetics of these places that are beyond just what we had for dinner tonight or tomorrow. Uh, there are sacred trails that are established that give places to cross these high mountains. And obviously these have been mapped onto by later peoples. And obviously these are major highways that we cross today. And then at some point in time, these mountains become an established homeland and they have residents that say, this is our place. And whether they defend it or not, in terms of warfare and violence, the populations are generally pretty small. So that's not, not something that we see in a, in a systematic sort of way. But they truly are belong in a sense of established places for specific groups in the past. So I like to use metaphors and analogies. Uh, and so we can think about this is, this is not when I drove up here a couple days ago. Uh, but you, if you come from Denver before and take an I-70, this is it's so revealing as you crest that first time and you see the high mountains, they reveal themselves. And of course, there's a Denver Mountain Park right there where the bison are, right? This is right by Chief Hosa. And this is the Front Range. This is the, the mountains that we view living along I-25 where most people live in Colorado. This is the James Peak Wilderness Area. I'll be talking about game drives that are up on that, those highest peaks there in the coming minutes. I-70 is a travel corridor. Right, it bisects our state from the east to the west. And so what do you do on travel corridors? Well, occasionally you're moving through them pretty quickly and you're staying at places like a Motel 6. You know what Motel 6 is all about. It has a bed, it has a TV, it has hopefully a lock on the door, but it's, you're not staying there for very long. You're going through very quickly. So in the sense of the mountains, is this how people are using these places? They're traveling through them very quickly to get from point A to point B and really not spending much time up there. Um, for, long, for long periods or for specific places. Well, uh, at periods in the past, it certainly is that uh, the mountains are used that way. This is some of our earliest culture. This is what we call Folsom points. These are 12,500 years ago or old um, in terms of this kind of fluted uh, projectile point technology. And what's amazing, for years we thought this was a plains-based culture because we have fantastic sites of this culture that are spread from Canada to northern Mexico. The most famous site of this is the Lindemeyer site, which is north of Fort Collins, a place that I work with my students. It's the biggest Folsom site known. But in the last 30 years or so, we now have abundant Folsom sites up in the mountains of Colorado. The yellow stars show you the locations in places like Middle Park and South Park and the Gunnison Basin, as well as the San Luis Valley. Uh, down by the Great Sand Dunes. Significant places at high elevation, you know, generally seven to 8,000 feet in these places. And that's high compared to, to, say, the coast of Texas or the coast of Georgia. It's not high compared to the 14ers behind us, but it's certainly in the mountains. And you can get, you know, there's some consequences of it. Now, what's interesting about these folks is that in green there are low passes in our state. There are hundreds of passes that are known. But each of these high altitude basins can be accessed by passes that are lower than 10,000 feet in elevation. So they are the first passes to melt. This time of year, they're starting to melt out. And you can get into the high country relatively early in the seasons, right? Kind of into the spring, well, well before the summer. So the fact that they're up here doesn't make it challenging for them to get up into these mountains because they're not truly in the peaks. They're in the valleys down below. 
Subsequent generations of paleo people, so this is between nine and 10,000 years ago, truly started to use the mountains differently. These are spear points from the so-called Allen cultural complex. They're beautiful points that have parallel flaking, diagonal flaking that goes from the upper left to the lower right on them. Um, and they're very diagnostic. We have these sites throughout the, the Rocky Mountain West. And these folks start showing up not only at passes, but also high altitude lakes, oftentimes in cirque lakes that are dead ends, right? These are places that you're not traveling through, you're going to these kinds of places. And it's probably not a coincidence that these folks are coming to these lakes after the end of the last ice age, because these subsequent periods, or the previous period, excuse me, all the glaciers above us had not completely yet melted. These folks are in, as soon as those glaciers melt, they're up there. So they're occupying that, that high country pretty early on, again, nine to 10,000 years ago. Where I work at Rollins Pass, we're fortunate to have some major Allen sites uh, up on the pass. This is a, a former student of mine. I was surveying probably two feet from him when he found this complete Allen point, and I was happy for him, <laughs> but incredibly jealous at the same time. Uh, but now we've documented a number of these Allen sites up at this particular pass at Rollins Pass. You can see Winter Park Ski Resort and Mary Jane in the background right there. This is a pass that connects Eldora Ski Resort and Winter Park in terms of as a, as a crossing. Other examples. Now this, I brought some examples from the Vail Pass uh, camp. Um, this is a kind of one of those transition type sites. I'm sure you've driven either to Frisco or Vail. This is right before the summit of Vail Pass. Uh, if you make a right there, you can go to Shrine Pass and go over towards Mount Holy Cross. And when I-70 was being kind of built in the mid-1970s, archeologists surveyed all these valleys to make sure things weren't gonna be destroyed. And in that process, they found this major, major campsite at Vail Pass. Looking at the historic records in the late 19th century, people referred to this location as Pottery Pass because when they're camping on this knoll, they noticed all this pottery laying all over the site surface. Excavations proceeded when they were building this rest area that I'm sure many of you stopped at many times. Uh, just behind there is the top of the knoll. The, the, the restrooms and the sidewalks circumscribed that knoll. Uh, the excavations were pretty, pretty large at the time and they documented over 8,000 years of nearly continuous occupation of this site. Not that people lived there as a, as a solid unit for 8,000 years, but people just cycled through there. This is a Motel 6 room that never took out the trash, right? And it just had all those years of stone tools and pottery and animal bones and fire pits just accumulated there, just below the surface of, of the site. It is just in the process of being redone. This is just this last summer. In the summer of 22, they, uh, they are remodeling it and putting in a new rest area. And so Alpine Archaeological Consultants out of Montrose was just there the last couple years doing archaeology. There's still archaeology in place. Here is excavations underway, and there's a nice T-shaped drill. We have examples of drills here as well uh, coming out of those excavations. There's I-70 down below. But one of those places that people are staying there for a couple days at a time and then going on. They're not living there as a house or as a, as a residence. But like many of you, <laughs> sometimes you keep coming up here and you have a long stay and the long stay turns into something else and now you all have become mountain folk, right? <laughs> and you are, are established in these places. And so that does happen here as well. Um, not too far from us, if you just jump over the mountains from us up in Eagle County, uh, in the late uh, 1980s, the DOT was enlarging the trough road. If you've ever driven that from State Bridge to Kremlin, kind of follows along the Colorado River there. They were doing some improvements. Uh, Metcalf Archaeological Consultants, go CSU, their alum, uh, based out of Eagle, was doing some work uh, and found this pretty spectacular archaeological site. Lots of tourism and uh, kids groups came and visited it. And they were able to excavate. Uh, this is one of several houses there. And, and to you, you're like, oh, that looks like a, just a, a foundation of a pool or something like that. Um, but to archaeologists, what we have is, is two lobes there. This is the bottom of a house. The deeper things that are showing shadows are storage pits that are going to occur below the floor of the house. And there's a whole bunch of central warming features there uh, that would have warmed this winter house. And there were several of them there, a small family group. 
um, daub that was used with wooden support beams to build the, the superstructure of that when the house finally collapsed, fell in and covered the floor of the house. In the house itself, a variety of stone tools. These are these pretty spectacular projectile points as well as uh, in the upper left and grinding stones for grinding plants to pulverize them to make porridges and, and thin breads, unleavened breads. And then other kinds of bone kinds of tools there as well. So we have bone awls for leather work and basketry and taking small animal bones and slicing them and snapping them to turn into jewelry. So this is jewelry manufacture. We think this was a winter house. Uh, these are the kinds of things that we oftentimes find in, in winter houses because if you don't have transportation and you're locked in your house all winter, that's when you're working on clothes. That's working, when you're working on jewelry. That's when you're playing all sorts of games in these places that are going to keep you warm over that long winter time. <clears throat> this is kind of a big deal because this is 7,000 years ago that people are, are putting up their winter houses up in, the, up in the mountains, not on the edges of the mountains, but in the mountains themselves. But as you know, this is down in the bottom. This is on the river channel itself. And it's only a stone throw from Radium Hot Springs, so I'm sure they went over there as well. So it's a short distance away. Um, finally, we have sites like this. This is Old Man Mountain uh, on the edge of Rocky Mountain National Park in Larimer County, where we work. There was the, the Continental Divide behind it. Here is this, this granite knob that sticks up uh, in the air. And in 1914, uh, right before the park was established, uh, two elders uh, from the Northern Arapaho Reservation were brought down by the Colorado Mountain Club to do an ethnogeography of the area. They had lived here in the 1860s, they were removed in the 1870s, but they came back and over a, a period of two weeks they, they traveled on horseback throughout Rocky and, and elsewhere and pointed out various kinds of places, trails, all sorts of things. So, so they give us some of our best native evidence for the Front Range in Colorado. One of the places they mentioned was this fasting site, Old Man Mountain, and they said, this is where we've always gone to pray. From the summit of that peak, the high peaks of Rocky just envelop you. It really is this striking place. Uh, several uh, years later, archeologists went to that site and formally documented in the 1930s, and it contained aberrant kinds of things like chunks of obsidian, which are coming from New Mexico or from uh, um, uh, Yellowstone National Park, those are closest obsidian sources, southwestern pottery, all sorts of things that we typically don't find. And again, this is in the campsite. It's not on the river. It's just this, this granite knob sitting by itself. But a good example of one of these sacred visionary type sites uh, for native peoples. Well, what I've just described is only a part of that record. And this is, for the most part, a low record. That It's up in the mountains, so it's not New Jersey that we're talking about here. It is high, but it's not this. Uh, this represents, so this is the Raywall Wilderness. We actually have uh, sites that we're working on in this valley itself. Um, some of those Allen points that you saw earlier, we have a really nice site uh, that's eroding out uh, on a glacial moraine in here. But what about these high mountains, these subalpine and alpine ecosystems? Uh, the, you'd call them the shiny mountains. Are people using these, these high altitude places? Well, let me start walking you through what we know about those highest places. This is a map of Colorado where in orange it depicts the contour interval of 3,000 meters, which is just about 10,000 feet, 9,800 feet or so. And you can see it's a, a pretty large area. You can see the major, ma major ranges that you'd recognize here. Uh, if you collectively add up all these lands, it's the size of the state of Maryland. So it's a significant amount of real estate above 10,000 feet. Again, other than Leadville and a couple other places, most of us don't live above 10,000 feet. We live, again, down below that. Now these places are significant to us, and I'm sure you appreciate this as do I, because a lot of these are wilderness areas. Uh, and we're almost to 60 years of the Wilderness uh, Act. Uh, and of course, when they wrote the Wilderness Act, they knew that people had been up in those places before, but they didn't really have an appreciation for definitely indigenous people using those places. But it's an idea, the concept of wilderness, that these are untrammeled by man, where people are just up there barely using them whatsoever. They're just kind of these, these, these uh, isolated kinds of places. Well, our research speaks to wilderness areas in a, a little bit different way. Here's our 42 in red, uh, designated wilderness areas in our state. We have many more uh, WSAs, or wilderness study areas. And in the other colors are other federally managed lands. And most of our wilderness areas in our state happen to be at altitude. They happen to be these high altitude places. 
So you might think that our knowledge of these places and the indigenous use of these places is, is something that we've discovered in the last decade or two or three, but it's quite ironic that the earliest archaeological sites that we know of in the state of Colorado were actually found in the wilderness areas, right, at the highest elevation. So the story of the Colorado, of Colorado archaeology should start in mountain archaeology, but it doesn't, right? This is the Hayden survey, really famous for, for traversing one of the many uh, mapping surveys in the 1870s that mapped the West. Hayden's made a beautiful uh, atlas of Colorado. They were, they were really were mapping the mineral resources where silver and gold mining and other kinds of things could be extracted. In doing so, they summoned at peaks. They're summoning these peaks to set up transit so they can map in mountains. And in doing so, they started recording things at the top of mountains. For example, uh, Blanca Peak, which today we know is one of the four sacred peaks of the Navajo or the Diné people. This is the northeasternmost sacred peak. When they summited Blanca, they described what looks to be an eagle trap, which is this kind of circular feature that we know from ethnographic records where native peoples would hide under a hide, and when animals, eagles would land on them, they'd actually pluck feathers uh, from the eagle's uh, um, tails. Uh, just an act of bravery. It's just kind of crazy. In some, some cases, they'd actually have a rabbit tied on top of the hide at the end of a rope to attract the eagles. And as they're landing to get the rabbit, they're pelican those feathers out. <laughs> when they're at Blanca, they're mapping across the San Luis Valley. So, so south of Creed, they say, OK, we're going to put up another transit station over there because it's a high place to map. You need high places to use transits. So they go uh, just south of Creed. Um, uh, near Fisher Peak, and as they're summoning this, they come across these rock walls and hunting blinds. And they're like, oh, they, they must have been hunting bighorn sheep or some other wild game here at elevation. Now, this is in the 1870s. They've already kind of started to figure this kind of stuff out. Later, railroad surveys in the 1880s at Monarch Pass, going over to Gunnison, where the ski resort is today. Same thing. All these high-altitude game drives are found at that low point crossing, getting into the Gunnison Valley. And then at the top there, Rollins or Corona Pass, I'll talk about this a little bit later. This was described in the 1870s uh, in the Rocky Mountain News, the former paper we had in Denver. There were so many artifacts, so many rock walls that John Quincy Adams Rollins, who wrote about this, thought it must have been a battlefield in terms of the sheer quantity of stuff laying up there. He actually found a wooden bow laying against the wall of one of these game drives up there. His descendants don't have it. Trust me, I've tracked them down <laughs> and tried to figure this out. But he's writing about this in the Rocky Mountain News. So let's pull some of this together. That's the 1870s. What do we know? Well, just to let you know where your tax paying dollars go, we have a central database at History Colorado in downtown Denver where a lot of these records are coalesced from all the different federal agencies, people like me across the state. So we can gather information from places like this. So here's some of the results of that. I've divvied up all the mountain ranges of Colorado into these 26 units. That allows us to kind of compare and contrast how different mountain ranges might happen to be used. You can see the Elks are right here in, in red, the Sawatch in yellow. Uh, and over that period from the 1870s to now, archaeologists have recorded over 2,000 sites above 3,000 meters. This is pretty significant. Uh, Mount Blanca being the highest, but pretty amazing concentrations there in the north in the Colorado Front Range, where I happen to do a lot of my work. Also in Grand Mesa, which makes sense because it's just a big flat mesa covered in lakes. And then a tremendous amount down in the San Juans, right, just in their southwest. You can see some ranges like the Sangre de Cristos, just east of the Great Sand Dunes, have very few sites. If you've been down there before, the mountains are like this. They are just, I mean, they are, those are some challenging uh, uh, 14ers for sure. Very few sites. To the south and the, and the Calabras, nothing, right? Now, part of this is people not looking. There's some, a lot of that is private land, especially on the, on the San Luis Valley side. But we can start to parse out some things. And the first lesson I'd like to share with you is not all these mountain ranges are used as intensively as one another or in the same way. So for example, the southwestern San Juan ones show this really heavy influence of the southwest, of people that are corn growers. And this makes sense. When we go into those mountains, there's lots of obsidian. When we chemically fingerprint that obsidian, it's obsidian coming from New Mexico, where all these folks are, are living. And if you follow those rivers to their headwaters, it takes you into here. These are all considered 
um, uh, folks that are living in tributaries of the San Juan River, which heads outside of Pagosa, if you've never been down there, but Pagosa Springs. And we have major, major southwestern sites spread throughout this kind of country. Unfortunately, a lot of southwestern archaeologists stick to the Pueblos, and they don't go up the hills, and those Pueblo folks are up hunting in those high mountains. And it would be a much more compelling story if they told their whole seasonal pattern besides just growing corn down low. They're supplementing with some pretty tasty bighorn sheep up in the high mountains. At Chimney Rock Pueblo, which is a new national monument that President Obama set aside uh, a decade ago, uh, there are um, bighorn sheep effigy pots at that Pueblo. So obviously they're interacting with bighorn sheep at places like Chimney Rock. Where we happen to be, uh, these units, the Elk and the Sawatch and the Collegiate Range, no matter how we add these things up, they contain fewer sites than expected. Part of it could be that we're not looking as much. Uh, I don't think that's exclusively it. I think part of it is just the nature of these mountains it tends to be pretty rugged. Uh, a lot of the other places that we work have really good cirque systems with tons of lakes, although there are lakes in these mountains, but a little bit different. I think that there's so much in the core of Colorado uh, that they're not as intensively used because they're a long distance away from, from other kinds of, of regional populations. And then finally, where I happen to work in the Northern Front Range, we have tons of activity here, and we think that these are plains groups using these, and just on a seasonal basis, going from the lowlands to the highlands and back and forth and back and forth. Same idea on the western slope, using the White and the Yampa Rivers, people are moving from Dinosaur National Monument area up into the flat tops and up into Steamboat and using that on a seasonal basis east to the west. And we put together various models. This is uh, uh, Jim Benedict, the late Jim Benedict, who has a seasonal round model, so on a yearly basis, People would travel from the hogbacks, which we call the banana belt of Colorado. It's actually pretty warm next to the front range. It's colder as you go out to Greeley. But on a seasonal basis, starting in about a month from now, people would move to the north up into the Laramie Basin, go to UW for a while, and then eventually go to North Park and Middle Park into the summertime. And by the end of the summer, they're up in the high peaks into the Shining Mountains. Do some hunting, and then they're going to winter, winter down in that lower hogback zone. Pretty intriguing kind of model. It's counterclockwise, and why do they do this? If you leave Boulder or Denver right now, you hit the highest passes, and they're all snow covered. If you go north, it's super easy to get into Laramie. It's windy as heck, but it's easy to get into Laramie, and it's easy to get in North Park because those are the same passes those Folsom points, those Folsom folks are using, really low elevation passes to get into those park basins. When North Park and Middle Park were first being explored by your American folks in the 1870s, they talked about them as being the Serengeti of North America. They were so full of antelope uh, and bison and elk and deer, they just couldn't believe how much animals were up there. The Northern Arapaho called North Park the game bag because it was just so full of, of hunting sites for them. And we have uh, amazing Northern Arapaho hunting sites at the very exit of North Park going into Wyoming. Okay, let's transition then to the game drives of Colorado. Now what I find intriguing about them is they are evidence of what we call communal hunting, where people are coming together, and oftentimes it's multiple groups are coming together because these folks are doing this at a certain time of year, and it's like a barn raising, or it's a sense that if we pool our labor, even though it's risky behavior, if we have a benefit, which is getting all this food out of this hunt, we're all gonna come out much further ahead. So there's just feeding your family part of this. That's a big deal. But it's also a big deal because you're coming together and meeting all these people and sharing bonds and, and all that great kind of human stuff of coming together is an important piece of this. Communal hunting is, is really an interesting topic because how do you decide who's going to do what? Is it you know, the oldest folks, the ones with the most wisdom, the best hunters, what if you have two different groups and they have different values about different kinds of things? And then you have the labor. And I want to show you these game drives. I want you to think about the labor of moving these rocks at elevation. It's bad enough to walk up there in terms of being belabored with, with shortness of breath. But then you're building these structures up here and maintaining these structures. How does that go about? One of the things that we see on these game drives is that some of them were used very short term and just as a one off. But some of them we call destinations that people came to time and time and time again and are actually remodeling or tinkering with them or changing their designs through time. There obviously are master hunters and architects up there that understand topography 
animal movement, winds, all those kinds of factors. And we're going to walk us through these in the coming minutes. The first thing I want to show you is what they look like in terms of just pictures of the architecture. This is uh, the Murray Game uh, Drive. This is in Boulder County. This is along Mount Albion, uh, which is within the city of Boulder's watershed. This is where they get their drinking water. Uh, so this is completely protected today. The black arrows are pointing to this sinuous uh, black line there. That's one of these walls, right? They're being constructed of rocks that are coming out of the pattern ground. This is rock that's been affected by glaciation processes. They're not carrying them tremendous distances, but still they're building these rock walls um, by the, the supply of rocks nearby. This is what they look like when you're looking at them from a, a human perspective. This is up in Rollins Pass. Uh, my student Aaron Wittenberg there up at the top, who now works for Metcalf Archaeology. Uh, this is one of those rock walls. Now, they were never uh, chest high. Uh, your best if they're, they're kind of waist high. Most of them are knee high. And we don't think they were chest high and they fell over. So you don't want to think of these as major impediments. Like we think of a fence to keep our pesky neighbors out. Or you think of the Great Wall of China to keep invaders out. These aren't serving that purpose. They really are just serving, you've got to think about what they're doing here. These are not for protection and battles between humans. This is for influencing the movement of animals. So the animals, rather than jumping across that, will actually turn, and I'll show you photos of this, and walk parallel or alongside those walls. So it's just affecting their behavior enough to change it and to kind of get them to do what you want them to do. Again, ingenious ways of, of doing this. That's not to say these aren't ankle breakers. If you walk across this very quickly, uh, you can easily get it. Or you should see me running in a lightning storm across these vast fields, uh, trying to get across here. Uh, they can get you that way too. So rock walls are part of this. The second one are cairns. And cairns are, are stacked rock. They can be two, two courses to three or four courses uh, in size. You'll hear all this stuff from Leave No Trace folks, Park Service, Forest Service. Please don't leave cairns. Uh, it's really hard for us as archaeologists, is, is one of the reasons they say that, because there's so many cairns now in the high country of people that are just bored or think they're building trails. Who knows what they're doing up there? Um, but this is the kind of thing that we're looking for, where we have undisturbed lichen colonies that span the rocks. Right? They, they, they span across, they bridge across the rocks. Uh, so they can be pretty subtle. Um, some of these cairns are like this. You can see several courses there. We have other things that we call um, tombstone rocks. And they're pretty spectacular kinds of features that they're typically large slab-like rocks that are lifted up like this. And then when you're looking from downslope, upslope, so you're turning around, your skyline there, right? So you're looking at the sky above. And they're going to be uh, set against that skyline. And they're so dramatic that you can just your eye catches them. And at first, you think it might be a person there. That's another type of cairn that we get in these kinds of systems. The final type of feature, the trio of them, are what we call hunting blinds, breastworks, other kinds of things. They tend to be circular in shape to semicircular. They range from about a meter to about three meters in size. So a little foreshadowing here. Why do you think some are one meter? Why would some be three meters in diameter? Uh, you know, so the size of a hot tub kind of thing. Uh, again, they aren't chest high. Uh, there are several courses of rock, so you can get into them in a windstorm. We tuck down into these things all the time, um, so you can get protected from the wind in there. Uh, but they're really, in terms, of, in terms of slope, they're really useful, especially if the rock's in the front side of it higher, uh, so that any animals coming up slope and you're in one of these blinds up above, they're not going to see you as they're coming up the slope. This one, you could tell, is not going to be used when this particular game drive, this on Arapaho Pass, is being visited because it's covered with snow. So that's a really useful way of finding these things. If you have mapped images kind of, of snow, we can see them kind of sticking out. There are little circles in there. But we gives us a window of time when these things could have been used. So once the snows come, that's the first place snows go is into these pits. Now, nobody's going to dig them out to use them. Uh, they really are a late summer phenomenon, early fall. How do we date these systems? Well, we try to find diagnostic artifacts. These are three different ones from one game drive that we're working up at Rollins Pass. The brown tan one is a dart point from a spear thrower that was thrown with an atlatl, which is one of the oldest technologies that we have. Uh, when the Spanish arrived in Mexico, 
The Aztecs were still using spear throwers and they were fearful of these tools because they could pierce Spanish armor with the force of that throw. Um, that technology is around North America for thousands of years. We have atlas come out of dry caves, say in the Four Corner area of Arizona, New Mexico, uh, here in Colorado as well. It's replaced with those smaller forms, both side notched like this and corner notched little arrow points. The corner notch are the first ones. They show up with our earliest pottery. The side notch ones appear uh, about a thousand years ago or so in time. So just like you could recognize different generations of phones, like flip phones versus different kinds of smartphones, they're all phones. These kinds of projectiles change through time as well. The function is kind of the same, but the style changes. And so we, if we mapped onto that, we can get ages from them. And we found these and dated them in archaeological sites to give us that index. We can also date charcoal from those hearths, or excuse me, from those hunting blinds. On some occasions, people are building warming fires in those, uh, those hunting blinds in anticipation of the event occurring so that charcoal itself can be radiocarbon dated to give us an age of when that blind was occupied. Another friend that we have, though, is peculiar to the high country, uh, and this is Rhizocarbon geographicum, a very specific kind of lichen that's called the map lichen. And because it's in an Arctic and Alpine environments, it grows very, very, very slowly. And so lichenologists working with archaeologists have actually established date, dating curves for this. So what we do is we measure the thickness, or the, the width, I should say, of those thalli as they grow out and get a measurement of those thalli and get thousands of those measurements. And that gives us a sense of uh, how big the lichens happen to be on, those, on the rocks that we're studying. Well, why is this significant? Well, as you know, if you go up into the high country and it's an area that doesn't get much snow on a permanent basis, you have lichens growing all over the place. If you pick up that rock and flip it over, there's no lichens. The, the downside surface has no lichens. As we always say, put the lichens back up. Don't kill our lichen friends. Put them on, on that face. But when these peoples of the past are building these features, they're picking up these rocks, they're moving them, and they're now exposing that surface that never had lichens on it to the, to the, the, the surface or to the exposed to the air. And the lichens start colonizing it and growing. And it basically has reset a clock or a watch on those lichens. In some cases, you can imagine in a very lichen area, you'll see these rocks and if they have no lichens on them, it changes the completely the dynamics of that rock field because now you have solid black or brown rocks versus this kind of green colored lichen type surface. In other cases, they wanna, if they want to dis disguise something, they'll put the lichens facing outwards because it's a camouflage effect as well. So lichens are another one of our friends. Okay, we're rounding base. We're gonna give you some very specific things on Rollins Pass. Here's our, our distribution of sites at elevation. What makes the front range so remarkable is about 5% of the sites at elevation uh, in Colorado, about 100 total, are these hunting sites. And almost 70% of them are in the front range. And it, we think it has a lot to do with Middle Park, which is adjacent to it, as well as the front range on the other side, the lowlands, and that animals are seasonally migrating through these mountains, and that humans have figured out that this is the choice place to take advantage of these migrating animals. We have dispersed ones in other mountain ranges. You'll see your fair mountain range might have one or two. These tend to be just isolated small segments of wall or a small blind. So let's look at examples from Rollins Pass, as I mentioned, between Eldora and Winter Park. This place has been known for a long time. Before the Moffat Tunnel was constructed, you know, the railroad tunnel that takes you to Glenwood eventually, that railroad used to go up and over the mountains. Right here you can see the railroad going right here, just about to go through this needle-eyed tunnel right there. <clears throat> and this was the route from 1904 to 1928 until the Moffat Tunnel opened. And this was a really fantastic place for, for tourists to get up into the high country. Uh, some great uh, silent films were filmed up there like White Desert, which is about people that go crazy up in the wintertime with <laughs> avalanches. <laughs> battling over, it's very melodramatic because it's a silent film, battling over this woman here in the background. Um, pretty neat place where tourists from Denver would come up. They'd love to come up in the summertime and have snowball fights in July and then go back to Denver at the end of the day. Look at all their hats uh, for the ornithology people in here. You'll be horrified by all the slaughtered birds 
forming these decorations on these hats. If you're all interested, there's a really good book that covers a lot of this history for Rollins Pass itself. Our field project there uh, has been working on the backs of the late Jim Benedict and Byron Olson, kind of pioneers in Colorado Martin archaeology, which about 50 years ago they did some serious work up there, kind of laid the, the groundwork and, and kind of passed the torch to me to continue some of this work. And over the last 15 years or so, we routinely go up there kind of late July after the snow kind of melts and do work at Rollins Pass as well as other high altitude places. This is what it looks like. You'll see some of these features uh, in this minute long film. There's the railroad down below. There's one of the rock walls. This particular photographer likes fast shots for some reason, but look at this long sinuous wall. This wall itself goes for over a half mile in length. Here's two parallel walls going to those areas of patterned ground where there's a killing field there. You can see the steep drop off there down below this to the down below to the right is into Boulder County. See that long sinuous wall there. There's beautiful Cirque Lakes down below in the background. So at Rollins Pass, there are 12 of those game drives. No matter which way the animals moved, north, south, east, west, southwest, blah, 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 every direction is blocked. We just looked at one tongue or lobe of that mountain showing these walls that you just see here in this particular image. So it's ingenious that they figured this out and had all these things constructed. It took millennia to do this and tinker with them over time. But let's look, we're going to look at this two different perspectives. First off, we're going to look at it just from aerial photos, and then I'm going to show you some mapped images to help you understand how these systems were used. Here's two of our biggest ones, uh, Olson and High Grade. They're both on top of these knolls. This is just a fraction of the walls there. There are many more. This is kind of a simplified version. And what would happen is animals would be grazing um, at the top of that arrow right there, and that is upwind. That's at the pass itself. And people would harass the animals, not getting them to run, but kind of just pushing them, being annoying as humans are, and getting the animals to move with the wind to the east, following along that wall. And this is much steeper than it looks. Um, and as they come to that wall, they turn, and they start going up slope. And you can see this is forming a, a large U or V-shaped kind of structure, and they're being funneled uh, up to the very top there. Here's one of those walls in action. Right. This is in October. Again, uh, this is a CSU field crew got stuck in a snowstorm up there. Uh, this is not the time of year they're being used, probably slightly several weeks prior to this, prior, right at the beginning of the rut or just slightly before. Some walls are not as spectacular. We have hikers walking through these all the time thinking these are mining features if they see them at all. Here's one wall. Here's another wall adjacent to it. Looks like they were tinkering with it or changing the orientation of those walls. And again, students measuring the size of some of these blinds. Again, a fairly small blind. And those features combine together. Here's a sinuous wall leading to one of those blinds. And if you look very closely in this photo, um, you can see um, there's some denuded vegetation here. And that's an actual game trail for modern animals that are actually walking through here, staying away from the walls. And in doing so, are going to their ancestral killing fields. This is an area where their ancestors were killed many, many years ago in the past. And we have, I put up game cameras on Rollins Pass to document this so humans aren't around. This is from another, and we get elk and stuff walking along those walls. This is from a little more remote game drive um, that's near Berthoud Pass. And here we have mule deer walking along those features rather than jumping across them. We've also documented bighorn sheep on this same drive system. Massive, massive bulls, or not bulls, but rams. Um, up on this particular uh, cone drive system. So we, we can figure out, based upon the faunal remains that we found in excavations at these blinds, the kinds of animals being hunted. Definitely bighorn sheep, mule deer, and elk. Um, but from places like this, these are called ice patches. We've also recovered bison at elevation throughout the, the northern front range, and we've dated it over 3,000 years ago. So bison have been crossing these mountains for a very, very long time. Due to global climate change here, nature is finally clearing out the deep freezer. And at these ice patches, which are like small glaciated type features, 
things are melting out. So we routinely, at the end of the summer, before the first snows, walk the four fields down below them and map animal bones, wood, and, and look for human artifacts that are, are, are eroding out of these deposits. We found several sites with human artifacts in them uh, so far. But here's an example of, of two bighorn sheep skulls that have come out of this particular ice patch. They're separated by 3,000 years in time. One's 340 years old, one's over 3,000 years in antiquity. So nature is finally clearing out that ice chest freezer in, in the garage that you never get to. Uh, and we're worried that these things are, are rapidly um, melting back. We've worked aggressively in the Front Range on these features. We've done over 40 of these. There are so many other mountain ranges in the state that we need to be doing the same kind of research. Elsewhere around the world, in Norway, uh, in, in the Alps, in the Yukon, as well as Alaska, they find spectacular archaeological sites coming out of the ice. So we probably have them here in Colorado as well. Okay, let's end with this. You're saying, this guy is just making this stuff up. He's an archaeologist. He'll just say anything to get an audience, right? Mm -hmm. Well, we actually have good ethnographic evidence of the use of these systems in the high Arctic. So we have high latitude versus high altitude. In the late 19th century, early 20th century, native peoples were still using these hunting systems, and people would ask them about them. So we have good illustrations. This is uh, the Copper Inuit uh, right on the Arctic Ocean. This is a great example of a woman that's actually facilitating this hunting episode. There she is at the top left there. She's got a stick. She's harassing and making noise. There's flags on both sides that are fluttering in the wind, which drives pronghorns crazy, by the way. And they're pushing this, in this case, caribou, towards these awaiting hunters with bows drawn in blinds at the end of that system. Their distant relatives, other Indian populations living in Greenland, here we have the same of folks hazing these caribou upslope with all these waiting hunters in that, in that killing field with bows drawn waiting for those prey to get to that exact spot. So what does this look like on our game drove systems? One more illustration as we're kind of rounding the corner on this talk. The hunts don't just take place though. You don't just magically say, okay, let's go hunting and let's make it happen. You kind of have to position your group up there like any hunting, there's a lot of waiting around. There's a lot of just what the heck is going on. Ethnographically, we know when hunters are doing this, they're doing all sorts of things up there. They're playing games. They're, they're, they're eating. They're resting. They have fires. So these blinds themselves, there's an example in the lower left there from a site up in the Brooks Range in Alaska of Nunamut hunters hanging out and doing all sorts of things at an observation stand where they're waiting for the game to show up. These blinds that we've been documenting, they're not always about bow draw stations. They could be used for other kinds of purposes, things before the hunt. We don't know the timing of that, though. During the hunt is our best evidence, right? And what the ethnographic record and from the archaeological record, we have evidence of shamans, which are, which are religious individuals within societies, that are actually calling the game. And this is actually a very important part of indigenous groups around the world. It's not a Native American situation exclusively. It's around the world with indigenous hunters. Here we have an example from uh, a site in eastern Colorado where this person is on top of a pole calling or drawing the bison in. This is from a 10,000-year-old bison kill where the remains of a post like that was found in the middle of the bison bone bed with a whistle at the bottom of that pole as well as a miniature spear point at the bottom of that pole as well, interpreted as a shaman's calling pole. That image, though, is replicated from the ethnographic record in Canada, in Manitoba, where the Cree are up on poles calling the bison in there, singing songs to the relatives of the animals to get them, to give themselves uh, to their, their, their human cousins right, for, for their food. So in terms of these blinds, think about how this structure would work in terms of leaders versus younger people, people that are good hunters versus poor hunters. Where are you going to position themselves within these hunting type systems, okay? So now we're gonna to turn to maps. This is an example of them we're looking from above. These are three at Rollins Pass. The black lines are the walls. You can see some cairns there in the lower left. The turquoise things are the blinds themselves. This is a group of three sites that have 80 of those hunting blinds on them, uh, over a mile of rock wall, uh, as well as cairn lines. Wind is from the northwest. We know that, and I ran from lightning storms from that direction too. 
So here we have animals being pushed into those first two systems, right? They're smaller. They're not as intricate as this big system. Perhaps they're hunted there, perhaps they get through and they get to this next biggest system. Down below that system, you can see a zigzag kind of hiking trail. That's coming on the Continental Divide, it's cliff, right? This is, if they get past that, they're falling off the cliff. So those animals are coming straight into this killing zone right there. So we can do things in computers, in GIS, geographic information systems, where we can uh, look at the density of things. We can do spatial statistics. And sure enough, that biggest one in orange is showing that those blinds are clustered. They're very, very close to one another. Same thing with the second one there to the left, less so to the one to the north. Well, what is the purpose of that? Well, if this is a barn raising, we want people to be successful. What do we want to happen? Well, if people are going to be taking shots, right, we want all those shots somewhere to hit something. So we're putting them all together in very tight spaces. And so sure enough, when we go investigate those areas of orange or high density, even to this day, even though this is a heavily hiked area, we find stone tools in those areas. Typically less than 30 meters away from the blinds, because with atlatls and bows and arrows, their effective distance is less than 40 yards. And so you're not finding them hundreds of yards away. These are missed, we interpret as missed shots where they never recovered that weaponry. Here they are still laying there a couple thousand years later. Finally, we can look at blind size. And I hinted at this to you before to think about this. Uh, here they are color coded in terms of size as well as shape. The blue are ones that are about a meter or three feet in diameter, little tiny ones. The red ones are three meters or, or about 10 feet in diameter, right? So differences in size. You can see some pretty spectacular patterns there. I did, this is how it patterns on the ground, which is, I didn't think this would work, but it sure does. The biggest blinds there are in the middle of these features. Again, on both of those, there's a couple that are out to the sides. The smaller blinds are, tend to be a little more spread out, right? Well, blind size is kind of a hard thing to kind of interpret what that might mean. Uh, and it's hard to interpret space. Uh, and so I use this index I've created looking at tents, right? And we know the, the numbers you get in tents are totally lies, that a two-person tent really doesn't mean two people unless they're children. And a four-person tent is a two-person tent. We get that, right? But in general, on the bottom is the number of people. On top is the floor area, so the space. And there's a really nice regression showing a, a meaning that is a very uh, predictable kind of relationship between those two. And on average, about one and a half square meters is what a human needs in terms of space. And this works for both tents, but I also have done it with hunting blinds that you can buy from Cabela's or Bass Pro, right? So it works for both kinds of things. So can we take this square footage data and then reproject it onto that past map and get an estimate of how many people might be in each of those blinds? And what is pretty amazing is here we have some of those big five person blinds right there in the epicenter, right? Smaller ones off to the side. Where do you send the kids and the less experienced people? If they miss a shot, well, good, good job. You did a good job. Thanks for participating. But you're spreading them out as, as individuals into their own blind system. And then all that labor is though is concentrated where it's most effective right there in the middle. The red ones, it might be that there's three people spread across there drawing bows and using that blind as a hunting center. It could be that's where the person that's in, in charge is kind of helping facilitate this through visual communication. And we've done hand signals and other kinds of things to look at can you see other people, which blinds can you see from which blind, right, in terms of that intervisibility piece. It could very well also be that after the hunt or before the hunt, that's just where you hang out. And that's what it's, it's just kind of the, the main spot at that particular site. <clears throat> and then finally, after the hunt, right, we have things like caching tools. Some of these blinds that have been excavated uh, actually have piles of arrow points in the blind itself. Are they storing them for next time? Are they a votive or an offering for what just happened? Are they a divination for what you hope happens down the road? We don't know how to separate those things out, but there's artifacts being stored in some of these features, not all of them. Here's an example of a shaman back in camp. This is actually, you might think this is here in North America or Canada. That's actually from the Ural Mountains of Russia, 
right, where indigenous peoples were hunting when the Russians were doing ethnographies of these people uh, in the 18th century. From the hunts themselves, the animals are being uh, are field dressed and then being uh, dismembered to take away for processing elsewhere. Oftentimes not on the game drive itself. If you look down this slope, see those trees there? We have camps down in those trees. But down below, we oftentimes have cirque lakes, and those always have sites on them. And so the animals are probably being dropped down there once you've done a successful hunt, because that's where your wood is, that's where your water is, that's where you're going to be spending your time after the hunt itself, after you've been successful, hopefully. So just as an example of this, I don't know if this one's connected, but this is a recent discovery just last summer in Rocky. You can see a really nice slope behind there. It's just perfect for one of these game drives. Um, this is a pot drop where people were carrying a pot, and we have pottery up on these sites up in the high country. They're carrying a pot, and we think they dropped it. It could have been an offering they left there and decomposed, but these are very common finds in, say, the Southwest. That pot shattered into 180 uh, little shards in about a 10-foot uh, diameter. Um, and so we're, right now we're doing some travel consultation um, with various travel groups as well as uh, the Park Service. To figure out what to do next, we could do residue analysis of that to see what they're cooking inside it. We can date it, all sorts of cool things. But this is approximately 1,500 years, uh, AD 1,500 or so, about the time of Columbus. So just to end, uh, this is an example of the use of the mountains. I want to show you about the game drives because it's a pretty spectacular example of people using mountain ranges on a seasonal basis. They figured this out. They know when animals are going to be up there. They're living adjacent to these places. They're timing it just right. They're pooling their labor to come up into the high country uh, to hunt these animals. And feeding your family is obviously job one for all of us in terms of taking care of our, of our kin as well as our distant kin. But the social reasons for coming together and building these walls in terms of building alliances and favors or what we call reciprocity, all that social goodwill that we as humans used to be pretty good at that's probably the bigger purpose of these things is not only feeding your family and distributing that food, but making these ties with all these communities that live uh, within your region as well. So to wrap it up, the point being, Colorado has some pretty awesome mountain archaeology. I tried to help you understand some of it tonight. From the valley bottoms to the mountaintops, there's a lot of stuff going on. Every range is a little bit different. These game drives come about really late in the sequence for me, oh, two to 3,000 years ago, so the time of the Romans, but it's still a long time ago. Um, but they only occur in certain kinds of places. And if there's a takeaway point for tonight, when you think about indigenous peoples, whether it's the Ute or the Cheyenne or the Rapper or other people, I really want you to think about the ingenuity, the planning, the patience, all these things that go into these, these, the construction of all these kinds of mountain type sites and hopefully come away with a renewed appreciation for what they did to make a living here and feeding their families and their kin for 13,000 years in time. And rather than being described as people that are just wandering aimlessly throughout the mountains and kind of just kind of chasing the game, I want you to come and come away with a, a, perhaps a little bit different understanding that it was very structured. And that they knew these places so much more intimately than even the best people in this room in terms of the people that know these mountains like the back of the hand. These folks knew that because their whole lives depended upon it and all their frames of reference of how they viewed their lives and their families were dependent upon these shiny mountains that we also enjoy um, today. So final thought, let's protect more wilderness areas in the West. Uh, I know we like to protect them for natural reasons, for ecology and for, for, um, for the animal and plant resources that they contain. But I think they have a lot of cultural stories uh, that are worth hearing. And I think those, those stories can really affect our lives today. So I, again, I hope you take away that message uh, in my talk. I couldn't have done this work without a ton of help from all my students over the years. Um, been at CSU for 18 years. Lots of folks have come and gone. Um, those folks, some of the, the more uh, folks that helped with this work are listed there at the top. Lots of partners in the Park Service as well as the Forest Service uh, and getting all these projects taken care of. Uh, and then our funding has come from a variety of, of sources, including the Forest Service, the National Park Service, um, and the Jim and Audrey Benedict endowment that, that I run at CSU. So with that, I thank you for your time. I hope you learned a thing or two.
much, Dr. Zabel. That was extremely fascinating. Uh, we're going to open it up for a few questions. Um, and just try to speak into the microphone. I know it doesn't actually make your voice louder, but for the recording, it's helpful. Thank you so much. That was a really interesting presentation. And, um, it's, there's a lot of, a lot of uh, food for thought. Well, I hope so. That's yeah. A, yeah, yeah. Um, my question is regarding, in a lot of my wanderings in wilderness areas around here, I've found lithic scatters in high elevation sites. Mm -hmm. And um, it, is, it a, is that an important part of the archaeological record? And it, would that be something that, you know, if you found some points in some of these pretty remote places, is that something that uh, an archaeologist with the Forest Service or the BLM would want to know about? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. I mean, you know, this is very different. If you've been to the Four Corners or been to the Southwest and Mesa Verde, Chaco, places like that, I mean, they're living in towns, if not cities. And so they're growing corn. It's very, very highly dense things. And so this is a very different kind of archaeology. I love it because it's an intellectual puzzle to try to piece all this together and try to make sense of it all. So every little bit adds up. And so as I showed you, we have mountain ranges. We don't know what's going on in them. And part of it is we haven't been up there. And I work pretty aggressively with people who find things all the time. I mean, I, I want those people to call me that we go follow up on things. I mean, we go find it ourselves. We don't have a problem finding it. But there's a lot more people hiking out there than there are archaeologists. And so it's a collective kind of thing. Citizen science is what we like to call it because, you know, this is a great uh, example of where people can come together. I've given this talk before, or we've had people in the field visit us before, and they've mailed me artifacts from Ron's past that they had found in previous trips there. They mail them to us to be a part of this collective story. Yeah, so they're, you know, contacting your local Forest Service office. I can't guarantee, you know, you know what they'd say. Right. Um, but yeah, there's people that want to know this knowledge for sure. Hi, um, just to kind of follow up and clarify, um, I'm under the impression that um, archaeologists would prefer that the artifacts are left in place, right? And that we send you like the location information because for you to be able to see where it was is important, right? Sure, yeah. I, so um, look, on federal lands, it, be it belongs to all of us. It belongs to the federal government. So it actually is a violation of, of, of ARPA, this 1979 law, if you collect artifacts and bring them to your house. I'm not law enforcement, so that's, that's, I'm just telling you the facts. That being said, you know, the knowledge is super important. And so, like, I'd rather know about the knowledge, even if it has been removed, if you can show where it was located, um, that's, that's super, super important. Of course, if you're finding things, what, I mean, the, the thing that we would want people to do is take a photograph of it, take a GPS point of it, and then relay that information to, to the powers that be. I mean, that is the, the moral and legal thing that we'd like for people to do. But I'm also a human, and I know how people like finding stuff and, and the thrill of finding stuff. And how could I ever leave that there? I mean, that's a real dilemma that people face. And, and I'm sensitive to that without just wagging the finger that there, people are wrong. Thankfully, in our society, we've changed some of our ideas about values as well. Obviously, people come into this seminar series, care about ecology and care about protection. And these are resources that need to be protected. So yeah, leaving in place is the preferred, preferred structure. But there's also reality out there, too. <laughs> My question is a whole different route. But first of all, when the shaman, I mean, and I don't know if you know, but when the shamans called the bison or the elk or whoever, the animal, mm -hmm. and were there people pushing behind, or were these really magical people who sang the song that brought the animal in? Do we know that? Well, we definitely know from ethnographic. So this is people observing this happening, that they'll oftentimes be at that end spot. And on certain archaeological sites, there's good examples in Canada, there actually is a little box that we think those people are standing in to actually to be calling those animals in. But there's definitely are people, like human beings, that are helping with that. But no, you were, it's a combination of, of the metaphysical and the real world working together yeah, to make that event happen. 
And then I have just one other question. So there's a period of time, and I know you're talking hunter and gatherers, but there's a period of time where I'm sure some of these people became agrarian and, and had animals of their own that they f used to feed their families. Is there a time period when that kind of happened? And sure. did that alter kind of make it more difficult to see? Because I know that they used the mountains yeah. the, to feed, you know, they would go up and migrate because in the warmer weather there was more feed and whatnot yeah. up in the mountains. Well, in terms of pa pastoralism, after the Spanish show up in the Southwest and horses are eventually incorporated into native, into native lifestyles beginning in the 1600s, it takes 200 years for those horses to get to Canada. Not because horses can't run to Canada, is once those horses were gathered by native peoples, they did not want to lose them. And so intertribal raiding to take horses and gather horses, that turned into instant wealth. And so things change totally different when horses come in. Rollins, we always thought, okay, maybe that's just pre-horse kinds of things there. From one of those hunting blinds, we have glass trade beads that come from Venice, Italy. Those things are being imported in trading posts in the 1840s and being traded up to native peoples throughout everywhere. And they're actually coming from the floors of some of those blinds. There's also portions of a top hat that was found in one of those as well. And that might have been somebody on the train, but we have amazing 19th century artwork of native peoples on the upper Missouri loving to wear top hats. Mm -hmm. It was a major item that was being traded in there. And they had incorporated both Euro-American clothing with native design as well. Um, so we think these are used right up to the 1850s, 1860s. Most of these folks though, are still as hunter-gatherers. They're not, they're not, um, they don't have other kinds of domesticated animals other than dogs and horses. And they're not growing crops. Um, they might be trading for crops, but they're not growing them themselves. Thank you for these great stories and information. I'm curious whether you have collaborated with or shared this research with modern indigenous communities? And if so, what have those interactions been like? Yeah, you bet. I mean, that's, that's, that's a fundamental piece of modern archaeology that we share these stories. And, and um, yeah, we haven't done any field visits on this. But this summer, it's funny you should ask, in, in July, August, we're still getting the dates in Rocky. That's the hope this summer is to have one of these collaborative field trips. And there's some game drives that we're actually going to visit. Um, I know they've done it with other, not with me, um, but they have actually brought indigenous people to these kinds of sites before. Um, I've worked with them on a variety of other kinds of projects, but yeah, um, the stories are different, right? And to me, archaeology tells one piece of the story. I certainly don't have the whole story. I got a bunch of broken rocks and broken pieces of things. It's like a puzzle that you buy at Goodwill that's got a thousand pieces, but it's only got 450 in the box. You can piece together kind of what's going on there. You're not going to get the full story. So I'm very cognizant of that, first and foremost, that this is a, a very fragmentary story that I'm telling you. I'm doing the best I can to assemble the pieces collectively. But Native people, peoples also have stories and pieces of this story that have been passed down. And again, that's why it's good to have that collaborative nature to, to bring those, fold those two together to get perhaps similar perspectives, but perhaps different perspectives as well. Um, yeah, so great, great point. So that's constantly an ongoing thing with, with federal agencies for sure. Okay, we have time for one, maybe two more questions if you're interested. Um, I was curious about the term shining mountains and sure. whether you know if that is something just for higher elevation mountains or if that's a specific mountain range or if it pertains to many different bands of the Ute or just one band of the Ute? Yeah. Um, you know, I, I don't know offhand. I mean, that's what I've just always known from just collective research is that the, the Rockies, the Southern Rockies in particular, were referred to as the Shining Mountains. Um, and I don't know if it's a specific range. Um, but yeah, that's a really good question. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much again for coming. Um, yeah. yeah, we hope to see you two weeks from now for our last Naturalist Night on Wetland Ecology and Climate Change. So have a great rest of your night. Thank Thanks. you so much. That was awesome.